Well, welcome to Hemp Barons today, two amazing brothers. Thank you so much, Jeremy and Christian, for being with us today. Hi, Joy. Thank you for having us, Joy. Boy, we've got Jeremy Kletke, CEO of Davis Farms, and Christian Gray, partner at Agros Ventures, here with us today. Two incredible minds, hearts, and spirits uh, in the hemp and cannabis movements, and frankly, the regenerative agricultural movements and the revolutions of consciousness taking on. I'm very, very happy to have you gentlemen here today, and, and I'm excited to have a show dedicated to why it is we do what we do, what inspired us, and what our visions are for the world in terms of delivering on the promise of hemp and, and cannabis in all of its forms. Let's start, if we could, with Christian. Christian, a little bit of background about yourself and what brought you to hemp. Sure. After a, a solid 25 years of high technology um, startups and emerging markets, I got involved formally uh, with a plant about five years ago. And I did uh, a bit of research for Benson Hill Bio around uh, companies that were seeking to do genetic engineering, uh, work with germplasm, and use sophisticated uh, breeding programs. And that led to learning a lot about where the plant was, uh, how it was being bred, who was using it, and uh, post farm bill getting very active with uh, hemp genetics, uh, mostly in, in the U.S. And Jeremy, how about you, sir? How did you get involved in hemp? Well, this plant has had its hooks in me for a very long time, but uh, uh, I started in the early '90s here in Oregon. I have an Oregon background. It, it's it's part of the culture here, so it's kind of hard to escape the plant. Early '90s, um, fiddling with the plant, growing the plant at small scale, and then uh, had the opportunity to work in Switzerland in 1997 and 1998, doing CBD and THC production. CBD. THC one-to-one -one production at a field scale, a field scale when Swiss, the Swiss legalized cannabis and all drugs for two years at that time. And getting over there, seeing the plant at a field scale, understanding that there, there was more than just one compound making this plant work, um, it really set the tone for me. And since that moment, I've been an absolute hamster and an absolute proponent of this plant and really worked hard to bring it to light on the planet. Boy, have you ever. And Christian, what is it that inspired you as you began to learn about the hemp crop? Boy, that's such a, a big question. So I'll try and be uh, pithy. Uh, you know, my, my farming uh, experience goes back to future farmers of America in high school. And I'll date myself. That was in the 80s. And, you know, besides a few uh, vegetable gardens since then, I haven't done a lot of farming. So, um, you know, being reintroduced to the plant uh, in a commercial environment, looking at it through an agricultural lens and seeing the potential impact got me really excited. Um, everybody talked about, you know, the 25 or 50,000 uh, potential applications of the plant. You know, I think just looking at the, the 200 that are scalable and commercial uh, and viable today and the impact that can have in the environment, in uh, society is, is really something that can keep you up at night. Keep you up dreaming, hoping, yearning, calling, longing, all of it. And how about you, Jeremy? Give us some examples of, uh, of some of the things about the crop and what your vision uh, was when you were first turned on to the plant, so to speak, versus or juxtaposed against what it is now because my vision has, has changed as reality comes along. Share yours with us. Certainly. Well, I mean, we take the four facets of the plan and I, and I, you know, quote these from, of course, Stanford Wears No Clothes, which is sort of our, our hemp Bible, if you will, from Jack back in the day telling that marijuana prohibition story. But when we take those four facets of food, fuel, fiber and medicine, you know, I would say that we were really just medicine centric for a very long time. You know, my background is coming up in THC. And, and these are resin plants. And now we, we we're into what I really call resin producing, uh, you know, drug-based cultivar anomalies, if you will. And they're, they're CBD leaning plants, but they're still resin producing plants. So we're talking about the, the medicinal facet of this. Um, that's where we were focused for so long, but now we're starting to broaden out and me being a child of that, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm embracing all the other applications as well, you know, and, and I think that's 
something that we do knowing that that background and that history very naturally. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited. And my vision is just as Christians that we have an incredible opportunity right now in our hands to, to leave a better planet for our children, children than, than, you know, we're, we're doing right now or making an effort to do right now. And so let's talk about some of those ways. And, and I, I want to share as well uh, how my own vision has changed. I, of course, um, like you, uh, Jeremy, got involved in the plant in the early 90s. In fact, in 1990, I got an excerpt flyer about the Emperor Wears No Clothes um, at a Foxborough, Massachusetts Grateful Dead show. Uh, and the information on that flyer affected me on a cellular level. It really changed the trajectory of my life. Um, I did think that, uh, you know, we were on our way to killing ourselves, each other, and the planet, but that we should do so, you know, with peace, love, and music in mind. Um, and so when I found this flyer and began to be made aware of all of the things that hemp can do, it's rich history in the United States and throughout the world. In fact, would we really have had a United States without hemp begs the question. Mayflower couldn't have even made its way over here and we wouldn't have survived. Clearly the first law, 1619 in cannabis here was ordering farmers in Jamestown, Virginia to make trial of the Indian hemp seed. And so all of that juxtaposed with, and it is a felony to even possess a seed capable of germination. So here I was thinking we had no way out, that there was no path and no solution other than just to be as peaceful as we could as the world blows up. And I, I discover that actually there is a path, there is a solution here that hemp will help with all of these other solutions and permaculture ideas. And by that, I mean economic permaculture, building permaculture, legal, educational uh, permaculture, all of these things, um, but that it was illegal. So this harmonic convergence of a sense of justice and, and a sense of planetary healing that came together um, and, and altered really who I am and what I understood the world and the future and people and the, and the planet uh, to be. It just completely, you know, opened up my world. And then the visions moving on from there, um, you know, opening up a store in New York in the mid nineties, really moving forward when Vermont passed uh, their inaugural hemp bill um, in 1996, moving there after, be appoint after being appointed to serve as the secretary of the Vermont Hemp Council. And my vision at the time, now we're talk dating myself, it's 1996 at that time. Um, you know, we really are just in our minds seeing fields of hemp, um, seeing smokestacks and other factory looking things that we imagine inside there was going to be hemp in there and uh, and just picturing a world of people wearing hemp and eating hemp. So then several decades go by, we start to see things unfold. Certainly in Canada, they began to regulate the crop at the federal level with, with federal crop insurance and all. Um, beginning in 1998, of course, just for oil, seed, and fiber, not these more resin-producing anomalies that you you were just discussing, Jeremy. Um, so things started to get a little real, but still there wasn't a lot of travel, not a lot of looking around at that stuff. And and then Europe, Europe comes online, and of course, the 2014 Farm Bill happens here. And at that point, I realize, oh my gosh, I have no idea about how to grow this plant. Agriculture, I've been working all of these years to, to get the right to grow the plant. And now, oh my goodness, things have gotten real. So it's, of course, the, the gift that keeps on giving is constantly making us learn. Um, but now, just knee deep in what I call the chopping of the wood and the carrying of the water, which both of you brothers are knee deep in as well, is really the, the making sure that we get as m most non-hysterical and most common sense law and regulation at every possible level that we can, and really dotting I's, crossing T's, putting people together, networking the farmers, with the investors, with the infrastructures. And that's how really the vision has changed. Um, we start to see the real work that needs to be done going into these existing industries where we need to network and get people interested in starting to blend hemp with their existing offerings. So whether that be, and I'll say the list, and then we're going to go back to you guys just sort of to tee it up. 
human and animal nutrition, pharmaceuticals, body care, nutraceuticals, paper, textiles, biocomposites, industrial sealants and coatings, building materials, energy, uh, fuel, batteries, storage capacity, nanotechnology, biomedical applications. It's the whole deal. So with that framed up, Kristen, tell us a little bit more about what you really dream of for hemp or, or where you want to, to see, you know, the biggest impacts to start to take place here in the United States. Sure. And uh, not wanting to, to wax poetic or, or get too aspirational, because I think a lot of these conversations can become emotionally charged and, and people get a, a bit ahead of themselves. Um, you know, I'm definitely an optimist. I, I always see the, the brighter uh, side of things and, and opportunities all around us. But there's kind of a pragmatic approach to some of these things. And that's why a lot of the conversations, uh, I, I don't want to throw cold water on them around the 25 to 50,000 applications. But that's why I come back to tell me, show me 200 that are scalable and commercially defensible in the world today. And, you know, we can talk a lot about textiles. We can talk about cotton versus hemp, but, you know, a cotton blend or what, what can, you know, how do we get a shirt on the shelf at a competitive price point with alternative uh, textiles and have it be sustainable and not have it be, you know, underwritten uh, for 25 years or, or whatever that looks like. Um, you know, one, one thing I will say, and this was uh, not lost on me, Michael Pollan, you know, a phenomenal documentarian and, you know, the botany of desire. And I think as, as we talk about the plant and, and hearing people much more knowledgeable like Jeremy and, and other folks that I, I get the opportunity to learn from, you really wonder, you know, are, are we changing the plant over time to meet our needs or is the plant changing us? And you don't have to get too metaphysical about it. Just go watch, you know, what happened with tulips and what happened with apples. And of course, it's nice that the cannabis is covered in that uh, in that piece, uh, the botany of desire. But when you think about hemp and where it's headed and how we'll engage with it as a society, small agriculture, big agriculture, sustainable farming, uh, regenerative farming, all the things that you mentioned, you know, I really, I really hope and believe and dream that we can make hemp a large scale agricultural crop that solves a lot of problems and adds a lot of value to all of our lives. And, and that's really what I'm, I'm working on. Indeed. And, you know, I often say we used to shout from the rooftops, you know, in the 90s. And Jeremy, you were shouting with me, brother, and you know you were. It grows anywhere. It doesn't take any water. It doesn't take any inputs. Um, it's a miracle plant. And and certainly, I'm sure some spindly form of hemp will grow in the Sahara Desert. However, if you're growing for commercial purposes, you're growing the crop, uh, it's a hungry crop, as it turns out. Definitely is going to need somewhere around 18 inches of water. Um, it wants your good soil. And you're going to have to be pretty careful with it. It's very great once it starts to grow a canopy and, and compete with other weeds. But getting there, emerging out of the ground, now that's a whole other thing. Um, and so when we talk about this idea of regenerative agriculture, it's uh, not the easy. We say, oh, plant hemp, heal the soil. Not so fast, guys. There's a whole lot of uh, chemistry, as it were, organic chemistry um, around soil ecology and all of those things. And so uh, we certainly dial back and say, thank goodness, again, we've got at the same time going on here an agricultural renaissance, a revolution of consciousness, and I think a, a time where an even big ag. Um, will be able to start to understand that by changing some of their techniques, they're eventually over time, whether it be two years, five years, or eight years, by building that soil, they're going to increase their bottom line, whether it's yield, whether it is nutrient profile, or some other aspect of whatever crop it is that they're growing that's going to improve as a result of their employing regenerative agricultural techniques. It's going to happen. So what do you think? Um, uh, about hemp, about regenerative ag, and and some other uh, thoughts along the lines of where Christian was headed. Well, I mean, I I, I want to key into a couple of things that you said, and it's, it's awesome, Joy, that you're so tuned into what's going on with hemp and and you know where we are as far as it, how, how consumptive it is, what it needs, and and where we are as a baseline um, as far as ag goes and creating regenerative crop. And you know, obviously, we're deep in the genetic side of this. So when you talk about 
18 inches of rainfall. I want to raise my hand and say, but wait, but wait, we just did an Oklahoma University of Oklahoma panhandle study trying to find a, you know, a variety that would work um, in 11 inches of rainfall. So we're all leaning into that, you know, and, and so it's, it's coming. But I think, you know, where I am from, from, uh, from, you know, as far as moving forward in this heavy lifting arena that you and I are talking about, where we've done all this heavy lifting is the, the lifting isn't a lot lighter, right? Because now we're opening up new layers to the onion, just like you talked about, about, you know, what does the plant require? Is it consumption? Is it not consumption? Where can we plant it? What can we do with it? What direction are we headed? But I, but I think we are with the resin producing plants and what's really taken off in, in, and, ha you know, having an opportunity to come in and with this new crop, explain to the farmers how to grow it, showing them things like, you know, hey, listen, what, what have you been producing before now? What was your row crop prior to now? Um, it, it, it's enlightening. You know, and I'll give you a really good example. Currently, we have, what, 46 percent of the crop acres in the states are in two crops. And we know what they are. They're corn and soy. You know, and now we're getting all these corn and soy farmers that are looking to us and saying, hey, what what? In this game and it's neat that we're able to say to them okay well look you know you've been growing this ror crop and unfortunately you can't participate in something that's for human consumption year one but we do have an alternative for you we can plant a crop for you know for that we can use as a, a remediation tool that the end product can be a, a grain or it can be a bass fiber or another you know um, end use so I, I think just tools like that coming in are pretty opening farmers eyes and i see it every single day when we come in and talk about how you set up your irrigation and what's your nutrition program you know what does this crop really take that there's a there's a an, an, a, an awakening happening amongst farmers that they're seeing this crop as one a new economic opportunity but two it opens their eyes to the fact that hey maybe we haven't been as good as stewards of the land as we thought we once were and when we're looking at the direction we've headed, maybe that's not the best direction for, you know, and I think that really what that does, Joy, not, not to run on for too long, but it, it opens the doors to all of these other opportunities. Because once you've got their mind open to this crop as a resin producer and for human consumption and how they take care of the land and what they're doing, now they're looking at the, the fiber crops and the grain crops. And it, it starts to open their eyes to the idea that, look, maybe we do need to make some shifts. And so from the farmer standpoint, we're seeing that uh, on a daily basis. Indeed. And, and to be able to introduce ideas like, do you realize that if we add hemp into your rotation on under very many circumstances, we can help break the pest cycle. Do you know that these roots are going to these deep, unique tap roots will help to build the organic matter and what that's going to do? Let's now, maybe we can talk about cover crops. So I just see the hemp lends itself to all good ideas. Um, it lends itself to some crazy ideas as well uh, because of the beauty is in the eye of the beholder and certainly thoughts are in the mind of the thinker. Um, but these are the types of things that are uh, that are inspired. And it's interesting too, what you've made me realize is you say, you know, you're coming at it and it, it's taking all of us of say, hey, farmer, let's talk about growing this, you know, this resin producing crop. Um, and that is where the infrastructure is right now and huge opportunities, obviously, uh, for the various cannabinoids um, and other aspects of the plant that can be extracted, terpenes and whatnot. Um, I, of course, uh, I'm coming at it from an oil seed and fiber perspective. Now, certainly we do not want farmers to be growing varieties that they cannot sell because there is no infrastructure or processing facility for them to do anything with that. So it's an amazing sort of working in tandem and putting one step in front of the other where we're saying, investor, we would like you to invest in an infrastructure for a crop for which mm, very little of the crop is being grown right now. Farmer, we would like for you to invest in farming of a crop for which there's uh, not a lot of infrastructure. But here we sit one foot in front of the other each year since 2014, 
watching that infrastructure grow um, and the grain for that beautiful nutrient dense seed uh, processing is growing, you know, along uh, throughout the United States. I, I'm very proud to be a part owner of Colorado Hemp Works, which is the first post-prohibition um, hemp grain processing facility, Longmont, Colorado, and we've got uh, Victory Hemp Foods. We've got um, Queen of Hemp. Uh, in right in your, near your area, although I know you're more southern, Jeremy, I think more near that Emerald Triangle, um, whereas Queen of Hearts Hemp and Hemp Northwest are, are in very northern uh, Oregon, very southern Washington, and other grain uh, facilities. And I'm uh, Healthy Oils, which is Roger Gusis. I'm, I'm going to sit here and forget the name of his company, and he's amazing. I think it's Healthy oils, um, but that's Roger Gusha. So that infrastructure is coming. The fiber, we certainly hear a lot about, oh, this big fiber plant's going up, but we'll believe it when we see it, although there is one, IND Hemp, uh, and that's an acronym, IND. We just had uh, Greg, Greg Nieko on, and that is breaking ground in Montana. So that infrastructure is coming, but ultimately, what do we need to see? We need to see infrastructure for processing within 50 to 75 miles of every hemp biomass feedstock. And so things are probably going to get regional um, somewhat. And with that, Christian, if you were to predict maybe some regions or how do you see uh, potentially various types of hemp manufacturing unfolding uh, in the United States? And I'll give you a quick hint here. Washington state where I live, not a very big hemp state. We've got legal adult use and medical cannabis that we're allowed to grow outdoors here. There's quite a bit of uh, tax revenue um, being generated from that and a, a lot of hysteria around cross-pollination. So if I were to predict how it would all unfold in maybe 10 years or 20 years in the United States, I don't see a ton of hemp in Washington. Any thoughts on, on that? Christian. So I think I think one of the things that you're running into there immediately, and this has been challenging for me to wrap my head around myself, which is uh, agriculture focused on growing industrialized hemp, or in this case, low, low THC varieties, whether it's you know, food fiber or, or high resin producing, and all the folks that were aligned on the cannabis front or high THC production and issues about cross pollination or people concerned about what crops are impacting others and, you know, places that were early legal in California producing uh, high THC crops, not wanting, you know, hemp in their neighborhood. And so all, all kinds of interesting dynamics around that. Um, I'll, I'll just say that, you know, after being in future farmers of America and making it to a few County fairs and, and raising animals, uh, Farmers are sometimes like fishermen, right? They always want to tell you about the one that got away. And, that's, you know, they're, they're, what happens in one part of the state is not the same as the other. So a lot of the, the miles and windshield time I did in Colorado, far east, northeast side of Colorado and how they farm and be on the Kansas border versus what happens on the other side of the western slope is very, very different. And the guy on the Western Slope might think he's a farmer with his 50 or 100 acres. And the guy on the other side of Colorado say those guys are gardeners. So that's one perspective is, you know, kind of the size of the plot and the scale of what you're growing. Uh, another dynamic has to do with the economics of the land. What's it cost for the land that you're farming on if you're leasing it? And then you can get into water rights and what, how much water does it take for that crop? And so there's a lot of calculus and, and farmers are really good at producing crops efficiently. Uh, the good ones, you know, keep an eye on markets and understand what their crop's going to be worth and the investment and the cost to produce it. So I think what we're going to see over a five or 10 year horizon, and this isn't just in the U.S., it's globally, right, is these crops are going to migrate to the environments where the labor costs, the land cost, the production is going to be sustainable. And then we're going to have international trade and we're going to have things being shipped around the world. So if we're talking about fiber and grain, it's going to be grown in very different environments than boutique artisanal flour that's going to be used for smokable, as an example. Or if we're extracting some new cannabinoid that's the hot new thing, it might be all greenhouses versus outdoor or, you know, got indoors, a whole nother conversation. But, you know, looking carefully at the economics of it and to your point what's the uh, regional processing uh, power? What's the infrastructure that's in place? If you're going to do a bioplastics play, what type of variety or cultivar is that? How do you have to grow it at what scale to even make the economics work? So regional, 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 and it's going to be wi widely varied.
widely varied. And, and, and again, this is also another sort of, you're constantly learning. The plant is always pushing, learning, learning. Part of the way my vision changed, even in that 2014, I think it was probably around 2015, 2016, uh, my mentor and dear friend, Andrea Herman, um, really a global first lady of hemp was here in Washington and we were doing a presentation. Oh, we were doing a screening on bringing it home, that documentary that had come out in 2013. And we're sitting here in Washington and Andrea, of course, she's an American gal from Joplin, Missouri, but she'd moved to Manitoba in 2001. Um, and so her world was very, very real. She was, you know, in the fields, did her entire, she got her, the first the world's first masters, frankly, in uh, industrial hemp um, fiber and agriculture from the University of Manitoba. Side note, the government of Canada paid $80,000 for her to get that master. She's just an amazing gal. But, um, but in any event, we sat there in this Washington crowd and we were up front and taking questions and someone raised their hand and asked, you know, about the cross pollination thing. So this is really more beginning. And I'll never forget, Andrea said, well, you know, maybe Washington's not going to be a hemp state. And I looked at her, my jaw dropped to the floor. And, and I knew with a lot of my community members in the audience. And I remember going, she did not just say that. Andrea Herman did not just say that Washington is going to be a hemp state. But again, it was, it's a, just a lack of awareness, a lack of sophistication, it, it, always expanding all the time. And, you know, a few years later, I realized Andrea was just being Andrea and trying to be realistic and answer that question appropriately. Hey, maybe as it turns out, Washington's not going to be a hemp state, despite how much Joy wants to see hemp covering every acre of this place. Um, <laughs> Oh. The science is coming out, right, Joy? We're seeing the science now. You know, we're we didn't have an opportunity to learn about how how much cross pollination impacted a resin producing crop compared to in Manitoba. They weren't growing them side by side, so we've got Larry Smart and people like that that are doing studies for us and helping us learn. I, I apologize for me interrupt there. No, no, no. I was actually about to go to you. And by the way, Virginia Tech, I believe, got a 500000 It was either two hundred dollars or $500,000 grant from the USDA to study crop. I'm not used to getting on a podcast where someone's as tapped in as you are. You are. <laughs> enjoy. Like, the fact that you're aware of why we're not leaning into a fiber right now as heavily as we're leaning into grain producers for our dual and tri-crop. You know, we're leaning heavily into into grain producing for industrial because the infrastructure is not developed. It's further progressed in grain, as you know, than it is in fiber, even though there, there's big push now from companies like BMW and Porsche um, coming online to help drive that, that, in that fiber market, but we're just not there yet. And to speak to what Christian said, absolutely. This is about farming region. I mean, we, Christian and I are on a call earlier today with a farming group out of Arizona. And, you know, they're traditionally rootstock and transplant farmers. So this makes sense to them what they're doing, what, the way we want to take two weeks, get these plants hardened and getting them out in the field with a transplanter. This is all equipment that they're comfortable and used to. Whereas, you know, and, and so we're talking to them about direct seeding and it's, it's so foreign to them. But, you know, we go to Eastern Washington or Northeastern Oregon and they look at us when we're talking about transplants, like we're, we're nuts. How do you handle each and every individual plant, right? You just take a cedar and you fill the hopper up and you drive through the field. So, you know, speaking to what Christian was saying, I think the plant, plant is going to identify its regions where it needs to be grown. We're, we're working, like I mentioned, alluded to heavily on dry land crops because obviously we have all of this, you know, high desert ground across the country or, you know, marginal ground that's dry land ground where we're doing a lot of wheat production. It, this ground is perfect for doing hemp. And so we're trying to improve genetics and lean into that so that we can create um, from our side genetics that work for all these farmers. But yeah, the crop is going to differentiate itself just by the region in which it's grown. And uh, I think also with the feminized stuff, it's worth noting that the argument is pretty much subsided now. The resin producers on the THC side in the rec states are aware that we're not cross-pollinating with these resin crops for CBD because if, if you're buying the seed right, you're getting one in 5,000 true males or less, which just isn't a, a significant enough you know, quantity of pollen to impact the neighboring field. 
you know, in addition to the fact, and we've seen a couple of lawsuits already, but, you know, in addition to the fact that the plant basically ovulates people, it's somewhat of a miracle when a cross-pollination occurs. It can't happen every day of the month. Um, and, and there's a lot of factors involved uh, for, for, I think, uh, that to happen. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the other thing is, of course, the hysteria came from two things. One is there was some study, I know you gents know about it, where it was like, oh my God, we we, we could track the fact that the pollen traveled 2,000 miles. It can travel 2,000 miles. And then there is a, a book, and I, I think it's, you know, it's one of these historical Kentucky books, Hemp in Kentucky, and it talks about the visible pollen cloud that you could see moving across the field. And I'm sure it's, it's very human in Kentucky. And I'm sure that there are weather conditions where you could actually see this, but the the medical and adult use cannabis producers and resin producing hemp folks even, you know, get this idea uh, in their head of this traveling pollen cloud that can actually go 2,000 miles. And it's a very scary thing, right? But science, science and data, that's what we need, uh, science and data. And in fact, I, I visited my first dryland hemp farm um, and it was in, it was a, Hemp Northwest IND or Queen of Hearts Hemp IND farm in the Palouse um, in Eastern Washington a couple of months ago. And, you know, I think this is why we're so grateful to have Brainiac guys uh, and gals like you on working on these genetics because it wasn't bad. It could be better with water. And he had, by the way, used the particular drylands one, was particular lots of regenerative ag, cover crops, etc. So it was more experimental of very experienced uh, canola farmer um, adding that into the rotation. But, uh, uh, you know, the bottom line is it's it's about maximizing. And you correct me if I'm wrong, guys, because I'm dipping into an area that's your expertise and not mine. You're working on genetics that will maximize the crop. Um that will maximize yield and uh, and the characteristics that you're looking for in the plant um, under certain conditions. It's not going to be that you're going to necessarily be able to make it as robust a crop under perfect conditions, but maximizing and optimizing what the crop can be in certain conditions. Is that correct? Certainly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, trying to both through genetic selection, because the, the plan is all over the world, but also through epigenetic influence, which is what you're talking about, where we're allowing the plant's plasticity to play into the direction that we're trying to, to lead it. Or <laughs> playing back to, again, the Christian statement, or it's trying to lead us, <laughs> however you want to look at it. But, but absolutely, you're right. That's an interesting conversation and one I want to pursue and really some stuff that that's part of why I wanted you Incredible Brothers on today. Will you please talk, Christian, for us a little bit about us leading the plant versus the plant leading us? Wow, that's a, that's a great, uh, well, I'll, you know, one, one of the subjects, yes, I, I will try to, <laughs> one of the subjects that I thought would be interesting to bring up and not spending a lot of time on it, but just as, a, as kind of an example of, um, I, I'm guessing both of you are familiar with the Last Prisoner Project. And if we look at the plant's impact on society, we can focus on ag and absolutely, you know, the fuel, food, and fiber, and medicine that, that you're referencing. Uh, Jeremy from the Emperor Wears No Clothes. And we can go long, deep, and wide into all the potential applications, phytopharmaceutical, etc. But if we just pull back a little bit and talk about people who have been in jail for years for a plant, that's now becoming legal in many, many states for multiple reasons. And uh, the social equity piece, you know, what what people from what parts of the society have burden, you know, had the major burden and, and bared the burden of getting this plant into people's hands who needed it for health reasons, who needed it for whatever their, their justification was. How can those people still be in jail? And obviously many have been released uh, at large in certain jurisdictions. There's still many people who are going to spend their holidays behind bars. Mm, and have lost their, oh, I, I know it's emotional, brother, have lost their parental rights, their civil asset forfeiture, their jobs, their standing in the community. We were doing this, Jeremy and I, when it was not cool, man. We subjected ourselves to public shame, to persecution. Continue now that you've composed yourself, my yeah, brother. Thank you. Caught my breath. So, the uh, 
the activism, the hard work, the, you know, uh, I had a great meeting with a, a breeder uh, who's, you know, a three-time uh, Vietnam vet. He was involved in special forces and operations and, and Doc Ray has this, this amazing military career. And he also has had to serve time and he's public about it. And now he's out creating cultivars that are uh, high myrcene that are really focused on dealing with vets and PTSD. Why was that guy ever behind bars? That's one question we can say for the history books. Should anybody be behind bars today? And how can you argue that the plant isn't impacting society's opinion about that question? It's happening all around us. Is it taking too long? Is it slow? Is it fast? I mean, these are all these are all questions that we can answer in retrospect. But you know, it kind of feels like that that band that's an overnight success. It's been playing in bars for thirty years, and all of a sudden they break. And everyone's like, "Wow, this is amazing!" It's like, "Well, this has been going on for a long time. A lot of people have been fighting this fight." And I and I always want to show respect and, and honor those that have come before. And now others need to take on that mantle. And whether it's in K Street and inside the Beltway in D.C., or if it is in Silicon Valley and its venture capital guys, or if it's somebody that understands, you know rocket fuel, right? I heard that at one of the HIA conferences in the indigenous uh, colleges doing work on rocket fuel in New Mexico. I mean, so there's these outrageous applications and then there's the massive societal change. And for me to be able to have an honest conversation with my 80 something, you know, Irish Catholic mom about using this medicine <laughs> for good benefit and it not being stigmatized is, is uh, life changing. Man, and, and in, in such a huge way. And and if we discuss for a, a second, uh, you know, the reality that human beings and mammals have an endocannabinoid system. This is an, an, a discovery in our lifetimes that is nothing short of the world is round, not flat. Uh, we have an endocannabinoid system. We have receptors all throughout our bodies uh, that bind with these cannabinoids that receive uh, in so many ways or are modulated and, and stimulated by these cannabinoids. So the ethnobotanical relationship between human beings and cannabis is is undeniable. And Robert C. Clark has written us a fantastic academic type book on uh, cannabis and ethnobotany. So the relationship between us is is truly undeniable. And I even take it, you know, a, a step ahead and, and say, listen, I think the plan is so intelligent that it created its own prohibition, um, that we were going through, that we were going through an unavoidable better living through chemistry. Uh, listen, I don't judge the human evolution process. I'm not that smart. I just trust that humans are evolving. I'm not attached to how long it takes. What I'm attached to is making sure that I'm taking responsibility for my part in that evolution toward greater harmony among living things. And But other than that, I'm, I'm not that attached. And I'm pretty confident that if all of us continue to take responsibility for for our part in that evolution toward harmony, then it's all happening at the exact rate that it's supposed to. But so for example, we couldn't avoid better living through chemistry. We had to invent these crazy things thinking that they were better living through chemistry. And then we learned, oh shit, they might've been good here and they might've been good there, but oh my God, was there a side effect to humans here and a side effect to the economy here and a side effect to farmers are our, our most treasured and precious uh, contributors to life on earth here. Um, and guess what? We really screwed the planet up here. So what about the possibility of while we were going through that, which it started, I don't know, in the late uh, 1927, I believe, is when in 1925, we had five pages of the U.S. Pharmacopeia with, filled with cannabis medicines, but we didn't really know how they worked. They weren't really patented. And then they figure out how to separate salicylic acid from willow bark and make the first analgesic really competitor to hemp right around the same time where they're getting the, uh, the polymer synthetic patents on fossil fuel plastics uh, and other things. There were these sort of foundational linchpins. So maybe, just maybe, cannabis said, you know what, we're going to let you fool around with this better living through chemistry, but we're not going to let you turn us into wheat and soy and corn, which you're about to do. So we're going to go ahead and make some 
thing happen so that we go away and a group of people around the world during this time of prohibition will still know about me and they will learn about me and they will sacrifice for me and they will risk their personal freedom, their parental rights, their jobs, their standing in the community, the things that they own for me because they will recognize that I'm that important. And then when you really need me again after you've gotten this better living through chemistry thing out of the way, I'll reappear and folks are gonna steward me because they will have spent so many decades protecting me and learning about me. What do you think about that? And by the way, you're certainly welcome to say that is bad shit crazy, Joy. No, I, I think I didn't expect to come on here and have my mind blown. That's not, that's not <laughs> what we're talking about on this podcast. Usually we go on these things and we're talking to people that don't know what's up. So thank you for on my mind, Joy. That's absolutely awesome. And it, it plays right into my feeling and philosophy about the wisdom and intelligence this plant carries, you know, the, it, it, you talk about, you touched on that ECS, right? I think it's noteworthy that we aren't a bunch of people who have been chirping about this alternative because it's going to be better for the planet only. I, I think it's important that we acknowledge right here and now that when we talk about the food, we're talking about a superfood. We're talking about one of the best foods out there, period, that's made for the human body. When we talk about fiber, we're talking about a fiber that's superior in every way to the textiles that we're using right now, right? We talk about medicine, right? I mean, and, and lubricants, okay? We talk about grain, grain and oil, they're superior. I don't know how many people know, but until we had synthetics, we couldn't run in any of the high altitude aircraft, we couldn't run any of our petrochemical oil because it was seize up and at high altitude. So these U2s and all the stuff that fueled this crazy military industrial complex, you know, this was all run on hemp oil. So when we talk about these products being here as an alternative, it's important that we recognize and acknowledge that they're superior in so many ways. And now we talk about the ECS and you struck me here. When we talk about this plant's relationship parallel to us and its evolution with us, I like to say that every plant on this planet has figured out some way, some reciprocal way or something to, to pair up with to help its procreation, to help its longevity. And a few of these plants have figured out we're really good at that. The only one I know, and I use coca as, as, and the poppy as a reference, and, and the only one I know that does it in complete reciprocity in a way that says, whatever you need, I'll give. You express it to me and I'll give it back to you is the hemp plant. The cannabis plant does that with humanity and the human being in such a strong parallel. And the ECS, I want everyone to know who's who watches this podcast, and I'm sure, Joy, you've said it a dozen times because you're so tuned into this stuff. But right here and now, when we talk about these endocannabinoid receptors, the CB1 and the CB2 receptor system, these are so powerful that they're, they are. So when we talk about CB1 and it releasing anandamide, this is the molecule, the compound that makes us feel at ease in life. And we know that when we're in a state of disease, what happens, right? Disease. We open ourselves up to these problems. So that's one half of what this plant's doing for us. That's the THC side, as you know. And the other side, the CBD side, it releases this most powerful compound, this anti-inflammatory called 2-AG. And 2-AG is a, such a critical part of our development from the time that we're a tiny little, you know, multi-celled object in the womb all the way forward. So... These, this plant has figured us out, no question about it, Joy. It's, it's taken a journey with us, and I'm not sure if we're leading it or it's leading us. matter of fact, I'm pretty sure it's leading us at this point. But good. It, it's like on the, synergy. On the, on the prohibition. Yeah, you are dead on, man. I love it, Joy. Good job. Thank you. Ten times over for hearing and, and seeing me, brother, because I've been called worse than bad shit crazy. <laughs> I don't like being called it. Um, so, you know, and, and I'll say another thing, and you, you certainly experienced this, and I'm sure you already have Christian and you'll experience again in 10 years and 20 years. And it's the thing that the Larry smarts and the Gary Myers of, you know, hemp genetics international and the Jace Calloway and Himala, um, of, uh, of, um, Finola, the plant, even right when you think you've got it, 
oh, it's cannabis. It's going to change on you. And they love it. They love that there's always a surprise. There's always something new. It is this incredible evolving relationship that is just going to be with us forever. And and Christian, on the energy, as we sort of wrap up, when when we say, and Jeremy said it so beautifully, how different it is and, and superior in all these different ways to all these other crops. And when we look at hemp, it, it's growing, looks a lot like for fiber, canaf or flax. Uh, but on the nanoscale, when we really look at that, the nanoscale being a billionth of a meter, technology we didn't even have 30 years ago, we see that this cellulose, hemp cellulose, has surface area and strength second only to carbon nanotubes and graphite whiskers, which are cost prohibitive even on an R&D level to say nothing of making products that mere mortals like you and I can, can buy. And we're talking not just about so many nanotechnology applications, but specific to energy, to storage, to battery, to capacities. I'm not asking you to be a chemist here. I'm asking you to share your vision about how hemp can transform transportation, air and space and energy. Yeah. So uh, Elon's not available to patch into the podcast, but you know, <laughs> That one of the big uh, choke points in the energy supply chain, right, is storage and having max capacity at an efficient rate. You know, you can pull down all the solar you want and all the turbine and, and all the alternative sources of energy, but where do you put it and how do you manage it? So, uh, you know, what, what I've read and, and some of the things I've looked at in terms of, you know, pitch decks and executive summaries and a lot of the potential investment into the uh, battery and storage area is a huge area of growth. And it, it's one that, you know, I'll just I'll take you back to, to 2018, I guess it was, is that right? No, we're in 2019, when we, you know, set up the chairs in the tent that had the sheepdog show at the World Ag Expo. And we had a few farmers and a few other folks and the sheriff talking about hemp. And then you go to this pavilion and we're in, you know, going from one year to the next, we're walking across the, the parade ground with one plant is drawing a bunch of stairs and pointing fingers to having a pavilion and having, you know, 65 companies represented and, and thousands and thousands of farmers seeing this plant and that it is a plant and that it is the world they know, which is agriculture. Um, all those applications are coming and uh, it's, 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 it's an uh, honor to get to see it happen. Is it ever, man? Is it ever? And that World Ag Expo, which you have such a, a role in, that was incredible. Talk about that evolution. It wasn't just the pavilion. As you know, there was the pavilion. There was the there was a whole nother huge tent set up. There was the, the uh, Hemp Innovation Challenge, the Global Hemp Innovation Challenge. And talk about Elon. Didn't we have an entry of a, of a rocket scientist who works with Elon? Uh, yeah. And by, with his biocomposite, you know, surfboards and, and things like that. So anyway, just incredible evolution. I wanted to ask you too, Jeremy, as we close, when, and when we talk about anandamide, um, you know, and you, and you mentioned THD, of course, also CBC, right? I mean, CBC, cannabichromeme. Um, and we, we talk about anandamide, where does it come from? You know, shall I let you explain where that word comes from? Yeah, I, I can touch on it, and you can correct me if I'm not elaborate enough, but an anandamide comes from the Sanskrit word for bliss, right, which is ananda, and it's the Israelis that we owe so much to. It's the Meshulam crowd that dubbed that after, after dubbing THC. So, yes, it's it's definitely about bliss. There's no question about it. And we all need to learn how to live in a state of bliss, don't we? <laughs> We so who can't use more of that? And there's no way for me to improve upon or add to how you just described it, brother. Well, I can tell you that I cannot wait to have you back on. And we're going to get more, way more the next time you come in on genetics, certified seeds, common sense regulation. We'll get right back into, as we say, the chopping of the wood, the carrying of the water, and really, you know, doing the work uh, to deliver on this promise. But man, what a thrill it has been to be able to dedicate a show. I haven't done it yet. It's been over a year of Weekly Hemp Baron show. 
on a whole nother level where my heart and mind rest most of the time when I'm not going 100 miles an hour. And that is the future and a better world and, and making it happen. You gentlemen are such a huge part of that. I'm just so blessed to have you in my tribe. Can't wait to see how it all unfolds. And I cannot wait to have you both back on again. Feeling is 100% mutual, Joy. Thank you so much for having us both today. It was great to spend the time with you as well, Christian. Thank you so Awesome job. Thanks for doing this. For the world. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Right back at you. And everyone, you get to mjbulls.com. Go to Hemp Barons. You're going to get all of the links um, uh, that Jeremy and Christian have in terms of things that they're involved in. So you'll be able to discover more of the work that they're doing and various services that they provide. Gentlemen, thank you again and have a great week, everybody. Thank you.